Craig, thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to your, your talk and over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you having me. Uh, and it's great to have everyone attending this webinar as well. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about trying to uncover the the root cause of software defects and issues. Uh, and I think something, you know, something that I don't think we spend enough time on. Uh, we tend to, you know, I think too often rush into trying to fix things. And I'm really hoping that today's talk will help change our thinking around how we go about trying to solve uh, the root cause of our software issues. But I will say just uh, you know, up front that if you're here because you have some toothache and you misread what this talk was about, I am not a dentist, I cannot help you. We're gonna be talking about root canal surgery from a software perspective um, and uh, looking forward to sharing this topic with you. Uh, just a bit about myself, uh, I did say I'd introduce myself. Uh, and so yeah, uh, my name is Craig Reese. Uh I am the head of engineering at Old Mutual. Uh, I also am a regular blogger. I've got a website, uh, craigreasy.com, uh, and then also do board games. Uh, so I also have my own board game company where I've published uh, 12 board games at this point in time. So uh, if you love board games, uh, you're welcome to go to that site as well uh, and be able to download the board games. They're completely free. Um, and I have also written a book called Quality by Design, uh, which is really, it looks at software quality, but not so much from a testing perspective, uh, although it does talk about test, you know, testing as well, but more about how do we design software with quality in mind and looking at software from its very inception all the way through to the testing phase to ensure that we can produce high quality software at the end of it, because software quality is ultimately something that's really important to me and i'm really passionate about that uh, so it's not just about the testing it's about the overall quality of the software and so that's a topic that interests you which i'm sure it would be for a lot of people um you know, on this webinar uh, yeah feel free to, to to look into that details are on my website um and i'm from cape town uh for those who aren't so sure where i'm from i'm from the beautiful city of cape town um i think it's the most beautiful city in the world not just in south africa uh and i love it here so um, I always like to show these pictures to just make all the Joe Burgers on the call uh, really jealous of the city that I live in. Um, but let's get back to the talk. And really, it's about the root of the problem. Uh, and uh, what we want to talk about today is really just how do we go about trying to identify the root of the problem uh, when it comes to software defects. But I think one of the biggest problems is that we tend to fix symptoms and not root causes. Uh, and you know, if I put this in you know, an example of it, you you work on the software, you're finding an issue, if something's gone wrong, uh, you want to fix the issue, we found a fix for the issue, we've gone, we fixed it, uh, and then we move on. We feel like, okay, this issue has now been fixed, um, and you know, that issue that I found is no longer there, and we assume that that's good enough, and then we move on. So we tend to fix the symptoms of the issues rather than the root causes. So yes, we might have solved the problem that we had logged, but why did it occur? What really happened? Do we really understand where in the process this thing, you know, this particular issue, bug, incident, whatever it is, occurred and why, and what are we going to do about it? Uh, and I think the real problem is that we, you know, when we when we tend to fix fix symptoms and not root causes, uh, we tend to land up with a thing where we tend to repeat mistakes a lot. So you'll find a common issue where we've made a coding error. Um, uh, and we fixed that code here, and that's great. But then every single time we're releasing software here and there, we're making similar sort of issues. We're making a similar sort of error in our code or you know something with the same sort of feature or function constantly going down. Um, uh, and that's really what happens. We tend to repeat our mistakes because we don't really tackle the why does it happen. Uh, and even if we feel like we're making progress and we've gone live uh, and you know if everything's gone in and we've maybe reduced our defect counts, but you'll often find that those defect counts are the same things popping up and the same causes and the reasons why those defects keep on popping up happens. And so we tend to re repeat those mistakes, which obviously leads to increased testing effort because as a tester, uh, you know we've got to test these things over and over and over again. Every time there's a change, we've got to go back and test. And that increased testing effort is you know really really quite frustrating that you you've got to go test something you find an issue you've got to go test something you find an issue uh, and you're constantly finding the same sort of issues and retesting the same thing uh, and even if it's automated it's still frustrating to have to go through the cycle of increasing testing effort and things you know slowing down um, and that's not really what we want to do and that really leads to slow delivery excess maintenance um, but it also ends up creating a lot of technical debt because what happens is 
we tend to rush through fixes to get something out the door, either to rush it through production or to get production restored for whatever reason. Um, but then that list of things that actually need to get done to pro properly stabilize our platform, properly fix that coding issue or that design issue once and for all tends to not get done. And then that just builds up being technical debt that's not dealt with and that's going to hit you later. And so you might not realize it, but by not fixing the root cause of issues, you're going to cause long-term problems with your software. So it's very important that you be prepared to dive deeper into your software and really try and dig into what is what is going wrong. And then obviously it's wasted effort. Uh, we are fixing symptoms all the time um, and there's a lot of wasted effort uh, that comes from that. Uh, and that's not really healthy. So we really got to try and get out of that. Uh, another thing, and I put a separate slide just for this point because it really bugs me, but I think it's one of the, the, the key culture things that you find when we tend to focus too much on just fi fixing symptoms all the time is that we create a bug fixing culture. We found a bug, we fixed the bug. We found a bug, we fixed the bug. And it almost becomes this thing of testers are going out there trying to find bugs and trying to find as many bugs as possible and then just trying to get them fixed along the way. Uh, and that's not really a healthy you know, thing for us to be doing. We don't want to just get out there and try and fix a bug and find a bug. And I mean, I've spoken to, to people in interviews. I've interviewed a lot of testers, QEs uh, in my life. And a lot of them always talk about, oh, but we found this great bug and this great bug and this great bug. And I found so many bugs here and some bugs, bugs there. Uh, that's not healthy. We shouldn't be finding bugs in our software. So software is supposed to get better. Um, so if we're constantly finding bugs and you know taking pride from finding all the bugs that we found, we're actually doing something wrong. We shouldn't be finding bugs. We shouldn't be doing that. And that's not a very healthy thing to do. Um, uh, and I really want us to to change that. So again, we shouldn't be fixing those symptoms. We shouldn't be fixing the symptoms. We should be getting into the root, the root of the problem. What actually caused that incident? Or that issue uh, and really having a proper understanding of what went wrong so again to give you more examples so if i'm the, you know working on an application we've had a bug um you know what was the cause of bug? You know, maybe maybe we've tested everything but we're still finding issues in production because maybe our data is not right um and so we've gone in and we fixed it but then how do we get the data out in our test environments how do we actually spend that time to ensure that Next time we go around, we we don't repeat this mistake again. And that's really what it means at the end of the day to try and get to the root of the problem is, you know, and that's the thing that we're really trying to solve here is really trying to understand that why. Uh, we've all familiar with defect life cycles. I'm not going to go into detail. This is a high level one. It's not even necessarily the world's greatest one. It's just a very simple one. It just gives you an example of how it works. And uh, I think most organizations have a model like this somewhere sometimes a bit more simpler most times probably a lot more complicated with a lot more different sort of steps in the process but my biggest issue with most defect or bug life cycles is that we're very quick to get to with you know from that new phase to the closed phase um and we go in we retest it we verify that something works and then we close it off and we're like okay great i've gone through this whole we logged the bug we've closed the bug that again, is not really necessarily healthy because if you don't know why or what caused the issue, can it really be close? And this is sort of the, the, the question I pose when I'm now thinking about what does root cause really mean and a root cause analysis really mean? You know, if you don't know what actually happened, why did the issue get caused in the first place? You shouldn't be closing the defect. And I think that's a mistake that we make. And again, we tend to fix the symptoms. So we've gone, we found an issue, it's now been fixed. It looks like it's working. Great, I'm happy. I'm going to close the bug. But we, we're missing a very important step. Why? So there was a there was a coding issue. Why was there a coding issue? Uh, was the requirement not clear enough? Uh, was there a particular pattern that maybe wasn't well defined? Was it just a matter of human error? In which case, that's okay. You know, that happens. Uh, but maybe there was a symptom of something else. Maybe the requirement was too complicated. Maybe something was ambiguous. Maybe the particular module that we're working in doesn't handle this type of thing really well. And we need to rethink the way that this module of code is written to be able to make it a lot more easier. Uh, maybe our test data was wrong. Maybe there was something we missed from a testing perspective that might have helped replicate this and might even be something on the developer side, uh, you know, in the way that they unit tested the thing that might be wrong. 
uh, and there's a misunderstanding there. How do we clear up that misunderstanding? Um, and this is all surface level stuff that I'm talking about, but we can go quite deep in terms of what's really going on with an application and what's really going on with the software. But we shouldn't be closing defects just because something looks like it's fixed. We should only really be closing defects once we fully understand what went wrong and that we fully understand why this issue occurred in the first place. And that's, I think, really what it means for us to be able to say that we're doing proper root cause analysis. Um, uh, and another way I think of it as well is if you can't guarantee how to prevent the issue from reappearing, have you really fixed it? I spoke to you earlier on about the bug fixing culture. Uh, and I think this is the thing that, you know, what we should be doing and what we should be striving is, I think we all know this, we should be preventing defects from happening, not fixing defects, uh, you know, or, you know, we should be not saying, you know, as a software tester, I've uncovered 50 defects this week and in the next sprint, I uncovered 50. We shouldn't be taking our validation and we should be taking our validation. And you know, what? three months ago, we had 50 defects that we found. This month, we've got 30. And it's because of this, this, and this, and this, and we're making progress in our direction. Uh, and we should be aiming for zero. And it might sound like the pipe dream and probably won't happen in a lot of complicated systems. But if we're doing our job right, we shouldn't be finding a lot of issues. And if we are, there should be the really complicated stuff that makes you really proud, not the basic obvious stuff. We should be thinking of really complicated scenarios and really unpacking really difficult things about what our clients might be doing, doing a lot of exploratory testing, trying to explore those deep edges. That's the type of stuff that we should be, be finding as defects. And that's about the only thing we should actually be finding as defects. Basic stuff, fine, it happens once or twice, but it shouldn't be happening again. We should have put something in place to prevent that issue from reappearing. And if we haven't got that in place, you actually haven't fixed your defect. You fixed the symptom, but your defect is gonna pop up time and time and time again. And I think that's an important thing to be able to leverage and understand. Uh, and hopefully the key takeaway from this talk is we've actually got to stop and dig deeper uh, and look into what's really going on with the software. And I think to do that, obviously we've got to look at this root cause. We've got to go from how the defect occurred uh, to what can be done to prevent it from happening again. And I think it's a mind shift. Um, I think we often know that, yes, okay, how did the defect occur? Okay, great, there was this, I go through my user user steps, I went through this step, this step, this step. that's what caused the, dish, the, the, the like, defect, I fully understand that. But we, but we need to go one level deeper. We need to go, well, then what can be done to prevent that from happening? So this happened, I was able to reproduce this defect. Why did we miss it? What did we get do wrong? within our design phase or our development phase that caused us to miss or not think about this or to not develop for it properly or to make a mistake somewhere along the line in our design um, or in our coding? Uh, and then how do we prevent it from happening again? So what do we need to change in our process, in our design, in our coding practices that can maybe prevent this issue from happening in the future? I think a common one that we can often think about is those requirements. How do we get better at writing requirements? Because there's a lot of ambiguity and things that come wrong. But even things like common patterns that are popping up from a coding defect perspective. If you know that you know there's there's the common coding errors coming in, uh, you know, and you're finding this from a testing perspective, you can put linting standards in place that can search for that. Um, and static scans that can search for that. You can program the static scans to pick that up and say, well, you know, we've put up a tool in place that will catch the, these type of common errors because we know what they are and what's causing them. Uh, we as testers don't need to worry about this anymore. The devs will know that their you know, pull request or merge requests aren't going to go through because of this. We're catching it earlier. Uh, and so we're preventing even human errors sometimes from that phase. Or if there's patterns that aren't quite being used, or we're not so sure how integrations work, you know, we misunderstood an integration, stood an integration pattern somewhere. We can put measures in place, contract tests in place, things that can catch these things before they go wrong. Uh, and again, striving for that, we want to get to zero defects. Uh, and I will say I've worked on a project that, that had zero defects. I know it might sound like weird and crazy, but I've actually worked for a project where we landed up getting zero defects at the end of a sprint. We were worried at first. We were like, what did we miss? We're very concerned about this. But when we dug into it, it was really because of all the work we had done up to that point in time allowed us to get to a point where the developers knew very clearly what needed to get done. Things were defined you know, in such a simple manner that not only could we actually automate before the development work was fixed, that's how well defined it was, that it would made it very clear for the developers to be able to write the unit test that make it make it pass. Um, 
And you know, when we looked at the data around it, we were actually quite comfortable to go, well, actually, there aren't any defects, but it's not because we missed anything as tests, it's because we actually did our job right. We've actually identified you know, these things and even some of the outliers that we we're trying to think of, we couldn't find and fault. Obviously, it was a simple application. I think a lot of us are working on a lot more complicated systems where I'm at the moment at Old Mutual. There's a lot more complexity uh, for that to really happen. But when you're working on something simple enough, it absolutely should, should be that way. And I think we should always strive for that. Um, but I think to do this right, and I think this was to me probably one of the, 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 the biggest benefits of trying to do sort of a proper root cause analysis or dig into the root cause of an issue, is that it also forces us as teams to work together and collaborate. Uh, you might be thinking, I don't always know what what's going on. I don't know how to unpack it. Uh, but you can always work together with the people in your team. I'm personally a big advocate for software testers to be quite technical um, because I believe a software tester shouldn't just go out and find an issue that should be able to be technical enough to dig deeper into understanding this is what's wrong, this is what I'm going to do to fix the issue, being able to unpack, well, let me go check at the log files, let me go and you know, look at the data, what's happening at the data, what's happening at the log file, I'm going to try and reproduce this uh, and to be able to see if they can find it. Uh, but then you should also then collaborate with sometimes the architect or the lead engineers or the engineer that wrote the code and work together to try and unpack these things. Uh, you know, some issues are quite easy to identify. Oh, there was this error here or this error here, or we put the wrong data value in here. That's what causing it, or we left something out here, or there was a design element here that we forgot about, or there was an integration point that wasn't quite defined, and we missed that. But a lot of times, there's really complicated things going on in the software. It requires a lot of investigation. Uh, but if we really try and play with it and try and understand what's going on with the software, again, we can start to ask the question of, hmm, okay, we landed up at this point. What in our process needs to change so that we don't land up there? What Maybe there was a design fundamental that we got wrong and why. And we start to ask those deeper, bigger questions of ourselves to try and see, well, what do we do to try and fix it? Again, we're not going to solve every, every problem. It's not going to be easy to be able to get this right all the time. But it's definitely something that you want to see from this. And the beauty of really trying to dig deeper into software and having a culture which is now focused on actually finding the root cause of the problem rather than just fixing the defect is it actually brings the team closer together because you're not going to be able to do this until every member of the team is trying to see well how do we improve this together how do we operate and make sure that we're all doing the best of our particular jobs effectively to make sure that the end result of the software is better and i think that's a key thing uh, uh, and so things that you got to do so how do we unpack that root cause in our software? Well, I think firstly, we've got to obviously ask the simple thing, what does the defect issue look like in production? Um, and I'm going to be focusing mostly on production issues here. Obviously, you should do this within your sprint cycles as well. But like for me, I care the most about what gets missed in our sprint cycles and what lands up in production. But it also depends on where you're at. I've worked with some teams who had very high defect counts in their sprints, and I would actually stop them and say, that's that defect counts and come to be high, do some root cause analysis, start digging into that. Um, and it actually helped them reduce the defect count considerably. So you can do this on sprint work as well. Uh, definitely recommend it, but uh, depending on where you're at, sometimes from a priority perspective, you might want to focus on what things, you know, on production first. And that's why I typically tend to focus mostly on production, but it doesn't have to just be done in production. But obviously, what does it look like? What happened? You know, when this production issue happened, you know, how did it surface? What did it look like? What is causing it to occur? I think that's a simple question. Okay, this happened, and what about you know, what about causing it to occur? Yes, there's maybe root steps that are causing it, but is it like, is it bad data? Is it a bad call? Uh, was it a was it a system down somewhere that was causing this issue? Was there slow performance somewhere along the line at a data level or, or an API level that needs to be fixed that was maybe causing something to time out? Let's have a look and unpack that and make make sense of it. Then is the where is it occurring? Which piece of the code? Which function? Which part of our documentation? Which part of the application is not quite right? Uh, how do we fix it? I think that's the obvious one that we tend to do, rush to do, and then, but that then that the key part is then. But then, how do we ensure it doesn't happen again? And always making sure that we ask the question: How do we ensure that we can cut this type of defect out of our system completely? We might not get it a hundred percent of times right, but I think if we start asking this question a lot more, we are going to see a lot more progress and be able to cut down a lot of defects within these things. It's then technical questions that we need to ask, you know, along with those whys and understanding things is then, well then, do we have clear requirements? So we've uncovered these things, we start to ask a lot of questions. Are, are, are our requirements clear enough? 
have we thought about that? Did we make any technical assumptions? Maybe, maybe our requirements are clear, but the assumption is wrong, or we thought technically something looked this way, it actually looked that way. Why did we make that wrong technical assumption? How do we get better with it? We, how do we understand it? What data constraints you know, are causing the issue? Or what other constraints might be causing the issue? Sometimes things work well in isolation, but part of the bigger system when we deploy it and do the end-to-end -end testing, it surfaces new things we haven't thought about. Why? What happened? Was there a constraint that we weren't aware of? Was there some data that we weren't aware of? How do we better understand our data? How do we better ensure that we think about that type of data scenario a little bit more clearly in future um, so that we can get better at that? Um, how does it affect our security and performance? Uh, you know, how does this issue cause? You know, is this issue, yes, a performance or security issue, but sometimes it just surfaces as a performance or security issue. Something was slow, but maybe it's not a performance issue in terms of something's not optimized there might have been something else that's gone on going on with with the with the design principle maybe maybe there's an additional step for you know you know of integration that's maybe unnecessary that we can maybe look to optimize and think about to be able to help with that and sometimes a lot of functional issues can lead to performance and security issues but we log it as a performance bug because we think that's all it is uh, but the reality is, is, is there's actually a lot more to it than that um, and then we're selling ourselves short because we're not actually fixing things properly. So I think that's a key thing. Uh, obviously, you know, where are some of the pieces of code used in the software is another good technical question to ask. Because again, coming back to code and patterns and developers recall functions. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of very you know good sort of object-oriented programming going on, which means if a function is called here, it's you know. It's often used elsewhere more than once. And, and there's often a lot of copying and pasting, pasting or patterns that get used elsewhere in the code. Uh, and that's a good question to ask because then when we're fixing this, where else do we need to fix it? Again, we're fixing for this specific issue, but uh, I'm pretty sure that this issue exists in multiple things. And this is probably one of the biggest things I've seen in organizations of a large size like my own. Um, you find an issue, a team finds an issue and then, okay, great, we found the issue. We've we see what's happened with our design. We're going to fix it. We've identified it. That's great. And then they leave it there. Um, and they don't actually ask the question a bit deeper, but hang on, this design came from an architecture thing here that another team gave us. So we were leveraging something that's communicated elsewhere because I guarantee you, if you're not the only ones using that, other teams are going to find the same problem. This is particularly with process issues as well. They tend to follow for you know, organizations following a process that's maybe sometimes actually problematic. Maybe it worked you know, two years ago, but doesn't work that well anymore and it's causing issues, something, you know, needs to be done about that. And that's, again, something that's going to surface. Where else is this happening? And, you know, we've got to make sure that we address it across the organization. Don't just focus on yourself. Uh, and then I think, obviously, lastly, from a technical question perspective, it's important to just ask ourselves, how can this code be tested better? And we've also got to look at ourselves as testers and go, okay, maybe there's something we must, particularly when there's production issues, what do we miss? Yeah, from a testing perspective, what are the things we need to do to catch this better? Now, again, there are always going to be outliers that might be really difficult to find and really not worth the effort from a data setup perspective to be able to, to identify. But a lot of times, there's a lot of simple things that we can do that can just help make our testing better. And it's to own that and to make sure that we are being part of that solution and testing better. Uh, and that's really important. And you know, again, things that we really want to unpack and ask. Um, but I also know, and I think this is a, you know, when I've seen this in organizations is to really take the time out. And if you think about every single defect that, that comes up, particularly if you're at a team and you've just gone deployed and there's a hundred defects that have popped up from a big project, that's a lot of effort. Uh, yeah, if you're going to really properly unpack defects and really understand these things at a very wide scale and try and go to the real root of the problem, a problem and trying to fix that, it's going to slow you down. Uh, and the reality is many of us probably feel like I don't have the time to do that. I really, I just don't have the capacity. There's just too much work to do. We need to still have a lot of things. We've got strict deadlines. We don't have the time to stop, pull the handbrake up at every single issue and try and dig deeper at it. Uh, and this is where I think this next point comes into trend analysis. And I think this is where I think large organizations in particular are going to find the most value because the reality is, yes, we do need to dig deeper into the root cause of issues. The reality is we need to fix the root causes and not the symptoms. Um, we do need to do those things. But the other reality is we don't have the time and capacity. And so what we need to do instead is try and understand the data 
uh, and what's going on with it. And I think, you know, I love this quote from Albert Einstein. It says, you know, if you, know, if you want to know the future, look at the past. Um, and I think it's the leveraging data to help us solve problems in the future. We might not be able to dive deeper onto every single issue, but if we're logging consistent you know, issues consistently as an organization through our defect life cycles and our different tools, we should be able to then have the data that can give us a lot of information about what we can do to fix it uh, and leveraging that data. And so I think that's an important thing to then understand that if we want to tackle this properly from an organizational perspective, maybe we don't focus on every little defect that's coming through, but maybe we focus as an organization on what are the bigger trends that we're picking up. So yes, we have a hundred defects. Um, we're not going to have the time to go through them all, but if I know what the top five defects in my space are, as an organization, I can do something to fix it. So if I know there's a bigger process issue or a bigger requirements issue or a bigger design issue within my organization, I can now invest the effort to fix that particular thing because I know it's gonna have the widest range and impact across the organization, as opposed to feeling like this team is now just constantly having to slow down and pull the handbrake up to fix things. Uh, and that brings me to my previous point as well, where sometimes teams do things in isolation. You might not have the time to actually ask another team, well, can you look at this? Can you look at this? We're, we're using this. But if you're using trend analysis and tools that can give us these things, as a broader organization, someone can look and say, hang on, this trend is going on across multiple teams. Let's do something from an organization to solve that problem. And I think that's very important. Uh, uh, and I think you know a lot of it then helps you to be able to prioritize them. So here's a you know, high level example. So uh, you've gone through and now you're trying to identify what's the root cause of an issue. Uh, and so you might not be able to delve deeper into what the real root cause of an issue is, but what you can do is maybe start to categorize some of the things. Like we've identified that the issue here is requirements. We might not know all the details of requirements, but we know it's requirements. So high level, you've done a quick job to just say, we didn't have the time to really go through this in detail, but what we have done is enough to be able to say, we know that this is a requirements issue. It's related to requirements. Something wasn't right with our requirements. So we're going to log it as a requirements issue. We haven't solved it, but it's there. And just by being able to prioritize a root cause for that issue and be able to say, this is a root cause issue, we as an organization can now go back and say, well, you know, out of the 200 defects that were picked up across the organization this year, you know, 17% of that was requirements issues. You know, 27% in this particular case were coding issues. Where it was coding errors and coding mistakes. Can we solve human error? No, but maybe we can solve design patterns. Maybe we can leverage tools. Maybe there is a, you know, you, these days there's the AI tools that can catch a lot of these things for developers. Maybe we roll out that. Um, because if you add up getting better requirements, writing better code, designing software, you can cut a lot of the issues in your organization just by tackling that broader category. We know our code is an issue. We're having a lot of coding errors. Let's leverage the tools that can improve our code. We know our requirements are a large issue and our designs are a large issue, given this example that I'm looking at. These are things that we can unpack and go, okay, well, these are the things we're gonna do now. This team is not gonna go delve deeper, but as an organization, we're gonna delve deeper and understand what are we getting wrong with our requirements. So again, as a team, you don't have to slow down. The organization can take this load on and look you know, from a wider perspective to say, these are the things we're gonna do as an organization to change the way we work to give us better requirements or better design. And those are things you can do uh, from a high level perspective that can often help you go faster. And on those categorization, sorry, on that those like those categorization things that we can work on, these are some of the things that we can think about. How do we categorize the effects very quickly? And there is no exact science to this. Um, this is just some high level defect types that I could think of. There's a lot more. Uh, sometimes you don't want to go this deep. Sometimes you want to be a little bit more basic and granular, but you know, essentially you want things like a defect. You know, like a feature defect. A feature defect is we've just been working on a feature, we deployed it into production, we found an issue in that feature. That's a feature defect. We know that this defect is related to a feature we just we just released. Sometimes it's a regression defect, like it's you know, it's picked up in regression. And oh, hang on, this is something that was already there, and now we found it. Um, um, so it wasn't within the fit within the feature we're working on. It was part of something else we weren't working on, but clearly something happened. Yeah, and it's a regression defect. It's a performance defect, it's a data defect. We know it's performance slowed down. We know the data was wrong somewhere. We had to fix it. The system went out, the system outage. We know something happened, something went down. You know, an S3 bucket went down. Uh, how did, you know, uh, 
So it's quite easy to be able to you know, sometimes pinpoint some of these things. It's a security defect. There's an actual issue found that someone loved, some you know, security flaw that needs to get fixed. Uh, and often, again, just on the security things, we tend to pick up things where we got hacked or our customer raised a security issue on that side with something that showed. And then we tend to, again, we tend to just fix the root cause of the security issue. So we've made that particular part of the application more secure rather than question our entire security process to see, well, why did this actually make it to production? Because if, you know, and again, it's that whole sort of thing. So security is one of those things where you really want to shift left and take it to the, to the root because those are the type of things you don't want to go wrong. And so if a security incident does happen or a security defect is raised, you really want to work through and understand as an organization, we need to do something to address that because we can't afford that to go wrong. That's important. Something like a historic defect is something that's actually always been there. Um, we maybe we just didn't always know. And I've, you know, over my years picked up a lot of these things where a customer finds an issue, we find an issue somewhere along the line. We're like, where did this come from? And it's often those outliers from like really sort of weird things. And it turns out it's always been there. Um, it's a historic defect. Um, I understand that. Then, you know, and then known defects. Sometimes we know something didn't work or we know that we still need to get to it. And so we know, okay, these things are defects. And so these are different types of defect types that we tend to get. Again, not an exhaustive list, but these are generally the most common types of types that we get. It's important to categorize them. So within your defect tool, whether you're using Jira, whether you're using Azure DevOps, whether you're using you know, other sort of tools, it's important to make sure that you categorize the type of defects that are getting surfaced, particularly at a production level um, along the way. What modules are affected? So it's important to then also understand We've got a defect logged. Uh, what part of the application is it logged? What part of the application is affected by it? Um, uh, and if you can, what component of code is affected? I think too often we say this system, there was an issue, but what part of that system? Why? Was there a particular component in the code? If you know a list of these are the you know, different components that make up this broader system, in one of these components, this is where the issue was. So this is where we made the fix. Again, might not be the full root cause, but we're going to categorize that fix. This is where it was made. And we say this is the module that was affected. Sometimes there's multiple modules, but that's there. And then what's the complex, what's the importance and complexity of that module? So uh, you know, we made this fix here, but you know, it's not really an important module. So we're not worried about it. But sometimes we made a fix here. You know, this is a really critical module. We maybe need to, yes, it might be one issue, but maybe we need to understand this module a little bit more because if it's a really important module and we found an issue in it, um, depending on the, on, the, you know, on the severity of the issue, sometimes we you know, it requires a deeper dive. So it's important to understand that complexity and importance of the module to A, know exactly where to focus, but then also B, from a complexity perspective, know sometimes we need to simplify. So if we know that this thing looks quite complicated, we can say, well, maybe we need to simplify and do something with it. But it's important that we record that information. And then we get to the actual root causes of things. So, you know, now we fixed it. What was it? We've identified maybe it was a code error. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a design error or a data error. Some of the simpler things. Sometimes it's a deployment error. Something went wrong in our deployment process. Um, uh, so the software actually works fine. We just deployed it wrong. Or there was an environment error. Something wrong with the environment, either in our production environment or maybe our test environment is just wrong, and that's why we didn't pick something up. So you know our test environment is actually not actually representative of production. And so we would have always missed this regardless. That's an environment error or, or an environment went down. There could be a variety of factors, but again, these are different things that now we to know. Once we know that, we can start tackling things of how do we fix it. And then performance errors are some of the things to, to think about. But this is just an example of what it is. I mean, and that wasn't an exhaustive list of root, root causes. I think you can have about 20, 30, 40 different root causes. But this this diagram here, I think, really just explains a little bit of the issue. And so we're going to focus, you know, uh, and this just looks at like certain sort of things, like let's have a look at the requirement issue. We've logged it as a requirement issue. There's something wrong with our requirements, but um, what does it actually mean? So was the requirement description, was it inadequate? Was the use case was not captured? So you know, the requirement was there, it was quite clear. We just left the use case off of it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Was there a communication gap we need to work on? That is, Those are key things we need to understand. So we can't just say the requirement issue was was wrong this thing was ambiguous why was it inadequate do we need more information uh, you know if you know if a use case was not captured how do we get better at capturing the use case maybe you know it, it, is there is there a tool we can use to better identify these things uh, you know is there a process that we need to introduce to get better deal with these things that's something we've got to ask ourselves same with coding issues there's things that we can do you know and sometimes it's even a people thing like 
you know, our skill sets insufficient with a particular type of technology. How do we bolster that as an organization, again, to prevent these things from happening? Uh, and how do we how do we get better with dealing with these things? Sometimes the like testing issues can be things where, yes, this test environment was right. Yes, maybe we don't understand this requirement properly as a testing team and we can get better. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of things that we can do to understand testing issues a lot better. And so those high level things that I went through in this previous slide, they might seem like, oh, these are just basic things, but you can unpack each of those to such a layer. And then you can almost have a category for each one. And the reason why you want that category is again, you want to be able to get to the point where you can have that trend analysis, uh, kind of like we had at the start here, you know, a few slides back, uh, where we had that pie chart and it helps you to start getting things where we had this now, this type of root cause, those those sort of pie charts and things that you can have to unpack those things. Again, gives you gives you the key things that you need to focus on to get it right. And I think those are important things you want to do. And you want to constantly get to that thing of getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And as you go along, you'll typically find you're going to start having more and more categories as you start to ask more questions. So you might think you found it, but then you find maybe we haven't solved it. And then you realize maybe there's another deeper question or category we need to be thinking of that will get us there to better understand maybe some of these things along the way but it's important to have it there and then a key thing is to then measure that change so obviously part of solving issues and you know digging into the root cause of the issue is we think we found it have we actually found it how do we measure that the software issue is not going to occur again how do we measure that we're actually improving yes we can measure simple things like the, you know, we we found less defects but but why wait all the way to go? You, know, you have to go all the way to production to be able to properly pick up that something's working better. How do we, you know, what what can we measure in our development process and our deployment process that can help us ensure that we're getting better test coverage, that maybe there's better code quality of our unit tests? What are the things we can do that we can start to measure that help us showcase that this behavior change or these changes that we're doing are making an active difference, and that you're preferably not preferably not catching that too late as well so uh, very important uh, and i think that's really what i wanted to to leave with is the the idea of us trying to dig deeper into you know, into software it takes a lot of time but it's important that we do it as an organization i've seen companies bleed because they spend a lot of time fixing issues over and over and over again up to the point where they're almost like 30 40 percent inefficient because if you look at their sprint effort, they're spending 20, 30% of their sprint effort on fixing defects all the time. Um, and then you have a look at what they're going from a delivery and sprint cadence, and you can literally see the gaps coming through where they're not dealing with things properly. Um, and uh, they tend to then just keep repeating these cycles because they're constantly focusing on, we need to deliver. Okay, great, the sprint wasn't so great, but that's okay. We're gonna just throw more, more stuff at the team, try and get them to deliver and deliver and deliver. And then let's just, you know, let's just create another team and have you know five, ten more people you know at this problem. Let's just throw more people at the problem to try to get this team to work faster. It's not going to solve the issue. You're going to be slow. You're going to constantly spend time fixing defects because you're not solving the root cause of an issue. So it's vital solve the root cause of an issue. You've got to get that right. You've got to be able to spend that time. Uh, and as an organization, it's then very important, important. Um, that you start to look at. So even if your one team maybe doesn't have the time to, as an organization, it's critical. You've got to start dealing with these things. As an organization, how do you get better and constantly drive for that improvement? And I believe that if you can, you can get to a point where you can start to have less issues. I remember there was that one advert, I can't remember the name of the brand, I think it was Panasonic, the quest for zero defects. That should be our goal. We should want to have less defects. We should want to not make sure that when we deploy software to our customers, everything works does it seem like a pipe dream yes but if you it's not if you start to get deeper into the roots if you start to tackle this and then you tackle this and you tackle this eventually the only things that are left out are the really 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 complicated stuff that you'll only find very 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 seldom in your software uh, it is possible to do it um, we've just got to invest the effort to understand what's really going on with our software. And it's at this point in time that I want to open up for questions because you know, to me, this is, this is always the most fun part is the questions uh, that we have um, here. So I'm going to go through the Q&A questions that have been posted. Uh, but if there's anyone else that wants to sh share anything, then let me know. But uh, uh, I think the first one I see is from Rob. Um, I think SLAs associated with the defect process contribute to us trying to close defects quickly. 
this is this is true. And I think this is actually one thing I've introduced in my company, Adult Mutual, the difference between your defect closing and your incident closing. So we have an SLA on an incident. So if something happens in production, we've got an SLA to resolve that production a certain time. And But how we track the closing of the incident versus the closing of the defect are two very separate things. So an incident occurred in production. It can be a defect as logged as an incident. We've now realized this incident happened. It's actually a software defect. When it goes to the team to fix, that's no longer part of our SLA. Our SLA is how do we get solve this incident so we might find the shortcut to solve the incident but the defect itself won't close until we actually solve the root cause of it but the incident might be in so we've actually classified it separately between we're dealing with the incident the incident is to restore and make it look like this for the customer we resolve that but absolutely you know the defect itself we're not going to close that until we know exactly what's going on but I think you have, you're definitely robbers, robbers spot on there. We definitely got to try and change it. Um, a question from Tenzi Stewart. The other challenge is the developer versus tester dynamics. The RCA should form part of the dev stage already and as part of unit testing. Absolutely agree with you there. there is, this shouldn't be a testing thing. This should be a team thing. The team owns all the defects. The team owns the quality and uh, this like root cause analysis has got to happen at that stage. And I think even... You know, you like mentioned the unit test. I think a lot of times I've picked up a lot of issues in software because the unit tests weren't really good. Uh, it's having that conversation and your your developers and your teams should be really involved in the process of trying to understand, well, how do we get this count better? How do we deal with it better? Uh, and that really helps. And that collaboration with the, with the entire team is better. You're not going to fix requirement issues without your analysts getting involved with the process and understanding things better. You're not going to you know improve code quality without proper conversations with the developers to try and understand things. And maybe it's a unit testing thing on their side, but maybe there's something else on there so that they can do to help. Um, um, I see a question from Sipo uh, saying, I think testers sometimes do find the root cause, but the dev needs to come to the party to ensure that the root cause is addressed. That's That absolutely happens. Um, and again, it's that collaboration. We've got to come together. Uh, I think what's important, uh, and this is generally, uh, and this is a bit of a cheat maybe I've done on my side to try and help some of the, the dev involvement, but I think we've got to find different ways of doing it because we often found that the testers wanted to find the root cause. They might have believed they found one, but they were waiting for feedback from the developers and it was taking a while to get there and they weren't so sure how to deal with it. Uh, and so what we actually started to, to do to try and help that is we, we said, uh, you know, if the developer is not coming to your party, and this was obviously at the start of our process and trying to implement this, just log it as a coding issue. Just say root cause coding issue, put it through. You know, you know, after this happened for a couple of months where developers maybe weren't playing, you know, playing party, we're now having dashboards shown to the entire, you know, IT exec team of what the root cause of our issues. And now we see this, you know, you know, it's developer coding issues are the problem. Now all of a sudden they're going, you know, to the like, the, the, the like dev lead and saying what's going on why and then the devs are like no but this wasn't the reason well then it's like well get involved in the process showcase if you believe it really wasn't a coding issue then delve deeper and work with the qes or with the, the like testers let's work together that might have been a bit of a nasty way of dealing with it but i think definitely a way of being able to get that interaction and engagement going but absolutely we need that um uh, next question from rob um what are your thoughts around an effective defect knowledge base? Uh, I think that's great. Uh, and I definitely think this is where data can help us. I think if we have uh, you know, a lot of, particularly if we've been working with software for a long time, large companies, especially this is really useful. You have, you have a lot of data. You have thousands and thousands of defects that you're probably tracking, tracking as an organization somewhere. Um, and I think there's definitely a knowledge base that uh, you, know, you, can, you can leverage there and be able to draw upon. Um, and I use the data as much as possible. I think you use the tools, and there's a lot of analytical tools coming out now. Like I know Atlassian has launched an Atlassian analytics tool that's now built built into Jira, or at least part of the enterprise version of Jira, where you can actually start to do like really deep stuff to really understand some of these things. And so you can start to unpack those thousands and thousands of things within your defects and try and build a lot more things around it. But I think a defect knowledge base is fantastic. And I think it certainly helps again with the end goal of let's try and prevent things from happening. And I think that's always the key thing. How do we prevent these things from happening? 
Um, I, I see another question from from Tenzi, and I'm just reading through questions. Uh, you know, uh, if you know, you know, please ask more as we're going along, um, but you know, really keen to to hear from you. Um, but what testing tools can assist with the RCA and improve the, the, the testing process and defect resolution and management? Uh, I would say there's probably not one testing tool that's going to help you here. It's more about a process and how you leverage your tools together. Um, because you have your test management tool, wherever that is, which is tracking your tests. And using test management tools can be effective because you can also track which types of steps tend to fail more, where do tests tend to fail more in the process. So you can get a lot of information from your test management tool. You can get a lot of information from the types of defects within your defect tracking tool to get there. What's going on in your logs? Can you pick up patterns in your logs? Any issues that are going on there? I think you know, you know there's observability tools like Dynatrace. Um, uh, and Grafana that can be really good at visualizing and showcasing things. So these are the common issues and these are the patterns that we've picked and we've visualized these things. And it can help you to visualize what's going on underneath the hood, hood um, and being able to help identify sometimes what are some of those root things that you're finding, I think can be really useful. Uh, from a performance testing perspective, uh, you want to be able to obviously you know, use observability tools to help you. For, so when you're running performance tests or you're measuring performance, you can sometimes unpack where are the exact slowdown and issues and uh, be able to measure that through um uh yeah so it's a it's a good question but the reality is it's largely how do we use our tools how do we how do we actually um leverage those tools and i think it's more of a process thing that i would say that is key how do we how do we um change our processes to cater to allow us to unpack these things. Uh, uh, and like I said, in a large organization with teams, it's very difficult to sometimes do it at, a, at an isolated team level, but it's that it's that organizational phase of now, we as an organization, how do we pack? And I once worked for a large organization several years ago, but we were doing this root cause analysis across the organization. And I was one of the people you know, responsible for trying to manage a company. I think we had about 2000 engineers, roughly um, across the organization across different countries. And obviously there's no way we're going to speak to each other, work to each other. I mean, I wasn't, you know, there are teams that are doing things I wouldn't even begin to know, but we were just looking at the data and it was just, we, we were able to capture the data from the defect suites. One of the advantages we had was every team had to use the same defect tooling and we were just packing all the data in it. We also look at the data and say, well, as an organization, we've picked up these three, three to five things are the biggest cause of issues as within our organization and we put task teams together to say we're going to tackle this and then we would have a task team that would then run for the next six months to a year that would unpack how to do this better how to do this better uh, and that actually had a lot of long-term um in, uh, you know, benefits it really helped improve our software quality overall as an organization um uh, and actually helps us deliver code faster and at, at the end of the day so it just had a lot of long-term things because we were able to address so much so so effectively um, and, and at an organizational level. So because sometimes you as a team feel like, yeah, we, we're having these issues because this is going on in the organization and the business doesn't understand. This really helped the organization to start to understand sometimes what they were doing wrong, um, particularly when it came down to often deliveries and deadlines that weren't quite set or the business was trying to drive something. It would start to surface that the business was driving the wrong behaviors and we could tackle with that. And it definitely surfaced some of those things as well. So just as an organization, there was a lot of learning. And I think this is what you learn when you do a process like this, is you actually learn not just about how you operate as a team, but how you, but really how you operate as an organization as well. Um, any other questions? I think those are the only five. If I haven't followed up and if I haven't answered your question, let me know. Looks like they've run out of steam. Chris, uh, Craig, sorry, even if you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just three yeah, on. That looks like we're. Um, I think people are also, you know, late in the afternoon. So, Craig, I think maybe we'll call it a day there. I don't see any further questions coming on. If there are any closing thoughts from you, but yeah. before you do that, I just really want to say thank you so much. I found it fascinating. Um, I was thank actually you. kind of chuckling to myself. You can see I don't have that much hair left, and what is is oh. white. But in my day, I mean, I was a dev as well uh, many, 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 many years ago. And, you know, in those days, we didn't really have dedicated uh, Q&A environments, testing environments. You kind of did it all yourself. You did your coding, you did your 
test budget and all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting mm -hmm. to see sort of 40 years on, there's still some of the similar questions and challenges. You've got a lot more tools, a lot more technology, um, a lot more experience to draw on over the years. But it's interesting that some of the challenges are still there. And I suppose there always will be <clears throat> the innate nature exactly. of creating bespoke systems and coding and that kind of thing. So closing thoughts from yourself, Craig? No, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, this is something I'm passionate about. Uh, it takes that collaboration. It really takes us, you know, being brave enough to ask the right questions. Um, but yeah, it's it's something we've got to just get better at and get better at. And the more you do it, I think the better you'll get at it as an organization and as a team. Uh, but just make sure that you're asking those right questions. I think that that like power of asking questions and being brave enough to ask the questions is the key thing. But I'm also keen to hear more. And so even if you think about something later on, please, you know, please connect with me on LinkedIn or go to my website. I think, you know, I do have a and a thing on my website as well uh, you know i'm always keen to you know answer questions obviously if i do have the capacity and time you know but really to be able to interact with people and help them solve their problems in their space your passion comes through loud and clear my friends thank, thank you thank you so much craig we really have it thanks again to melini and and rob for being involved in the setup thereof um i'll ask you offline a couple of questions i want to ask you uh, craig not not about the topic and thank you to everybody who's joined. Thank you to those who've asked the questions, um, Rob and to Tinsy particularly, and to everybody else as well. So have a good evening, the Institute of IT Professionals and our special interest group at Software Testing. Thanks you for joining us. Have a great evening, everybody. If you've still